Why would you want to hurt him? You, you don't know kind. You're did that Dawn Johnson by face when you saw her? Yes, sir. And did you know Brittany Ryan? Reports of maybe firecrackers. Uh, somebody had set off firecrackers or something like that at Pearl High School. Gather and understand what information was available and, and what else needed to have. I didn't know what he was up to, so I pointed the shotgun at them. Number 15, T.J. Lane. In the small town of Chardon, Ohio, the tranquility of a high school morning was shattered by a senseless act of violence that would forever leave its mark on the community. The name that would echo through the halls of Chardon High School and sear itself into the collective memory of a nation was T.J. Lane. T.J. Lane, a troubled teenager with a brooding demeanor and an air of mystery, would become the protagonist of a grim tale that unfolded on February 27, 2012. With an unsettling calmness, he entered the school cafeteria armed with a 22 caliber pistol. In a matter of moments, shots rang out, chaos erupted, and the lives of innocent students were forever changed. Sick to my stomach and my hand was shaking. A lot of people had a similar reaction. So here's what happened to recap. This strange dress shirt on, he unbuttons it. The t-shirt, as you saw underneath, he had hand printed the word killer. He wrote a go, he had that shirt on. Then he smiled, smirked, rolled his eyes the entire time. Why would you want to hurt him? You, you don't know kind. You're, you will never ever be in my thoughts after this. Never. My family, he was thinking about inviting you back to that, to that table because he felt sorry for you. I feel sorry. For you. The brother in the courtroom and that did this was not the brother I knew. They suspected TJ Lane. When those words hit me, I shook and cried and denied that all this could be true. As the chilling details emerged, it became apparent that Lane had deliberately targeted a group of students, aiming at random victims who happened to be in his line of sight. The devastation was immense, as three students lost their lives and three others were left wounded, their dreams and aspirations abruptly shattered. In the aftermath of the tragedy, the community sought answers, grappling with the unimaginable pain and seeking justice for the lives lost. The legal proceedings that followed would provide a glimmer of hope in a sea of despair. T.J. Lane faced charges of aggravated slaying, attempted slaying, and felonious attack, carrying the weight of the lives he had forever altered. The courtroom became a stage for the emotions of a grieving community as family members of the victims stared into the eyes of the young perpetrator, desperately searching for some semblance of remorse or understanding. The trial unfolded with gripping testimonies, graphic evidence, and a haunting sense of loss that hung heavy in the air. Then, the fateful moment arrived, the judge's gavel struck the wooden podium, and T.J. Lane's fate was sealed. The sentence that echoed through the courtroom was a resounding proclamation of justice, three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Computers have said publicly that T.J. Lane chose his targets at random, but investigators tell CBS was that Lane's girlfriend had broken up with him the week before and started dating one of the boys. I, this happened, I only wish I could have done more. I'm here to tell you that tomorrow our schools will be open. I tried to figure out the, how I should feel about us, all this when they were all my friends. Number 14, Andrew Golden, Mitchell Johnson. Mitchell Johnson, 13, and Andrew Golden, 11, shot their classmates and teachers in Jonesboro, Arkansas on March 24, 1998. Golden, the younger of the two boys, asked to be excused from his class, pulled a fire alarm, and then ran to join Johnson in a wooded area 100 yards away from the school's gym. As the students streamed out of the building, Johnson and Golden opened fire and took the lives of four students and a teacher. Ten other children were wounded. The two boys were caught soon afterward. In their possession were 13 fully loaded firearms, including three automatic rifles and 200 rounds of ammunition. Yes, sir. What is your full name? Mr. Scott Johnson, sir. What is your date of birth? And, sir, I did not pick her out or anybody else that was killed that day. Were the shootings of the individual? Honestly, I don't remember me shooting, period. Okay. Was this uh, Don Johnson by face when you saw her? Yes, sir. And did you know Brittany Ryan six rifle five times, correct? Yes, sir. And you stopped shooting it because you ran out of ammo? I got mad and lost my temper, and I, and ju I just um, ruined this morning. That is my problem. The hangover is from too much pop, and I put. I do believe that's what it says. 
I hate two teachers in the school. Uh, the two people hate, I hate are Miss Somebody. Their stolen van had a stockpile of supplies as well as a crossbow and several hunting knives. All of the weapons were taken from the Golden family's personal arsenal. Both of the boys had been raised around guns. Andrew Golden belonged to a local gun club and sometimes competed in shooting contests. Because Johnson and Golden were 13 and 11, they could not be charged as adults in Arkansas. They were both adjudicated as delinquent and sent to reform institutes. They were to be released when they turned 18 as they could legally no longer be housed with minors. But Arkansas bought a facility in 1999 that enabled the state to keep the boys in custody until their 21st birthdays. Johnson was freed in 2005, but later returned to prison for other charges. Golden was released in 2007 and perished in 2019. Arkansas changed its laws following the Jonesboro tragedy so that child slayers can be imprisoned past age 21. Question. That's what we would have to expressly agree to do in order to have the stand. Given this calls will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. Would you state your name? No, I will let you go back and add to an answer you've previously given. Is that understandable? Yes, sir. Number 13, Luke Woodham. The Pearl High School attack was a shooting that occurred on October 1, 1997 at Pearl High School in Pearl, Mississippi. The incident began on the morning of Wednesday, October 1, 1997, when Luke Woodham fatally stabbed and bludgeoned his mother, Mary Ann Woodham, as she prepared for a morning jog. At his trial, Woodham claimed that he could not remember slaying his mother. Woodham then drove his mother's Toyota Tercel to Pearl High School. Wearing a trench coat to conceal the rifle he was carrying, Woodham entered the school and gave a manifesto to Justin Sledge. Sledge, realizing what was about to occur, gathered some friends and hid in the safety of the library while the shooting took place. Woodham then fatally shot Lydia K. Dew and Christina Menefee, his former girlfriend, then went on to wound seven others. In one of the first highly publicized mass school shootings, there had been ones before, but what Luke Woodham did. Deadly school shooting in Connecticut. It's a tragedy all too familiar to the community of Pearl. When I got there, it's because the two young ladies that were killed were still there. Reports of maybe firecrackers. Uh, somebody had set off firecrackers or something like that at Pearl High School. Remember about our initial, my initial assessment going in was uh, the, the looks of The sound would never get out of my mind. Just like boom, 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 boom. The school's assistant principal, Joel Myrick, retrieved a 45 caliber pistol from his truck and spotting Woodham attempting to flee the parking lot after the shooting, shouted for him to stop. Realizing what Woodham was doing, another student used his own vehicle to block Woodham's path, at which point Woodham attempted to get around the obstruction by driving his mother's car onto a grass verge, only to end up getting stuck in the grass. Seizing his opportunity, Myrick ordered Woodham out of the car at gunpoint and detained him until police arrived at the scene. There were separate trials for the slayings of Woodham's mother and the mass school slaying. Woodham's lawyer argued that both trials that Woodham was insane at the time of the slayings. Jurors rejected Woodham's insanity defense at his first trial for the slaying of his mother, and he was sentenced to life in prison on June 5, 1998. His second trial took place on June 12, and he was found guilty of two counts of slaying and seven counts of attempted slaying. With the jurors once again rejecting the insanity defense, he was given two life sentences for the slayings and seven 20-year sentences for his attempted slaying convictions. He is currently serving three life terms, plus an additional 140 years in prison. He will be eligible for parole in 2046 when he is 65 years old. And this was Stan Manatee's my ex-girlfriend. We broke up about a year ago. Uh -huh. I, I really meant to do it in my mind, but yeah, I didn't want to because it wouldn't be right. Yeah. I mean, you know the difference. I mean, people were surprised because probably no one because it's the way I acted. And uh, most people just hated me, just did. And uh, people always picked on me, they always called me gay and stupid stuff like that. And I tried to, re I tried. Number 12, Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, the infamous perpetrators of the Columbine High School bloodbath, left an indelible mark on the history of such tragedies. Both born in 1981, Harris and Klebold grew up in the quiet suburb of Littleton, Colorado. At first glance, they seemed like ordinary teenagers, but behind their facade of normalcy, a dark and violent plan was brewing. On April 20, 1999,
Harris and Klebold implemented their meticulously planned attack on Columbine High School. Armed with an arsenal of firearms and explosives, they unleashed terror on their fellow students and faculty. Their rampage resulted in the tragic loss of 13 lives, including their own, and left countless others injured physically and emotionally. In the aftermath of the shooting, a complex picture of Harris and Klebold's lives emerged. Both had experienced struggles and difficulties. Harris had a history of anger issues and displayed sociopathic tendencies. He harbored a deep-seated hatred for society, fueled by feelings of superiority and a desire for revenge. And then we heard what we thought were rocks being thrown against the window. And then we heard a bunch of screaming. Secretary uh, ran into my office and said that there had been gunshots. That's where I saw the gunman enter, and that's where the shots were being fired, and then the glass was... She ran in to the library, uh, screaming and yelling, saying there's two kids with guns out in the hall. I'm a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. And the school is in a panic, and I... Yeah, shot twice in the head, and one in the foot. Um, I think the gunman was shot. Yeah, shot twice in the head, and once in the foot. Klebold, on the other hand, grappled with depression and feelings of isolation. Together, they formed a lethal partnership sharing their resentments and planning an act of horrific violence. On the day of the slaughter, Harris and Klebold entered Columbine High School armed and ready to inflict maximum damage. They unleashed chaos and terror, targeting individuals seemingly at random. Their motive, although complex, was rooted in a desire for notoriety and to surpass previous acts of violence. They wanted to leave an enduring legacy that would be remembered long after their demise. As law enforcement responded to the scene, the shooting eventually turned inward and Harris and Klebold turned their guns on themselves. In the library, they took their own lives, ending their reign of terror but leaving behind a trail of devastation. I actually went with identifying information for um, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. You go to the noise, you go to the shooter, you, you neutralize them whatever way you have to, and it's okay. Well, I, mean, I guess I knew I was okay then, you know, that I, could, I was actually going to... You know, I was actually going to live at that point. I just shoot me. <laughs> he just put the gun in my face and started laughing, saying that it was all... With my good leg, my left leg, on the floor, weaving through tables and chairs and ultimately... As we started moving, uh, we had nobody telling us, okay, to the science room, if you... In a video production class, Eric was in some of our upper level classes. They were good to carry a shotgun on a sling and a 9mm carbine on a sling without being seen. Number 11, Nicholas Cruz. In the sunny state of Florida, nestled among palm trees and vibrant communities, there exists a terrifying tale that shook the nation to its core. At the heart of this story stands a name that has become synonymous with tragedy and horror, Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Cruz, an enigmatic figure with a troubled past, would etch his name into the annals of infamy on February 14, 2018. With a mind burdened by darkness, he set foot inside Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, armed with an AR-15 and a heart filled with malice. Consulting with counsel when needed, um, and that you are not having any difficulty understanding that you are now on medication. Is that correct? Are you taking your medication as prescribed by your medical? Uh, that's based upon his answers to my questions, as well as uh, the court's own observations. He imposes a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole for the murder in the first degree of Joaquin Oliver, the court imposed degree of Peter Wang. The court imposes a mandatory life sentence without with a 20 year minimum mandatory prison sentence under Florida's 1020 life statute. What followed would forever scar the lives of countless students, teachers, and a grieving community. In a matter of minutes, Gunshots shattered the tranquility of the school corridors, sending waves of panic and despair through the air. Innocent lives were cut short, dreams were shattered, and the wounds inflicted on the survivors would run deep. As the news spread like wildfire, the nation stood in collective disbelief, grappling with the magnitude of the tragedy. Nicholas Cruz, a solitary figure haunted by his own demons, was apprehended shortly after the bloodbath. As the legal proceedings unfolded, the courtroom became a theater of emotions, with tearful testimonies and a quest for justice serving as the backdrop. Families of the victims confronted the young perpetrator, seeking answers, closure, and a glimmer of remorse that would never come. In the end, the verdict was rendered, the judge's words cutting through the tense silence. Nicholas Cruz would be sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The weight of his actions, the lives he had extinguished, 
and the irreparable damage he had now caused rested squarely upon his shoulders. Families of the deceased believed this was an unfair sentence, and instead, Cruz should have perished for his actions. Number 10. Charles Andrew Williams On Monday, March 5, 2001, at 9.20 a.m., 15-year-old Charles Andrew Williams began firing a 22 caliber revolver in a boy's bathroom at Santana High School, slaying two students. He then left the bathroom firing the revolver indiscriminately at other students. According to one witness, Williams repeatedly walked out of the bathroom, fired shots, then went back into the bathroom. The scene soon turned chaotic as students and teachers ducked or scrambled to safety. Williams reloaded his revolver at least once. A student teacher and campus security supervisor, Peter Ruiz, walked into the bathroom to try to stop Williams, but Williams aimed the revolver at them and forced them out. As the student and supervisor walked out, Williams fired and hit the Ruiz in the back. Dropped the weapon and he did. He immediately dropped it on the floor with a big old clang. Neck. And I said, who shot you? Who shot you? And, and he said, Andy, when everybody else is crying and running and screaming, you've got to kind of think, you got to, you got to. Two off-duty police officers who were visiting the school were alerted to the shooting. However, they were at different ends of the school. One of them approached the bathroom and called for backup. Police officers quickly arrived and charged the bathroom. They discovered Williams kneeling on the floor with the weapon in his hands. He told officers that he was by himself. Williams surrendered and was taken into custody. He shot and slew two students, 14-year-old Brian Zucker and 17-year-old Randy Gordon. Thirteen others suffered gunshot wounds. On June 20, 2002, Williams, in an effort to avoid a trial, pleaded guilty to all charges against him. On August 15, 2002, a California judge sentenced Williams as an adult to 50 years to life in prison. We're adamantly opposed to Williams' request for release. We also reached out to the governor's office. They say, on this campus back in 2001 changed so many lives. And victims tell me even though that request... Number 9. Jeff Weiss The Red Lake High School carnage was a school attack that took place on Monday, March 21, 2005, in which Jeffrey Weiss a student at Red Lake High School in Red Lake, an unincorporated section of Beltrami County, Minnesota, took the lives of seven people, including a teacher and a security guard. In September 2003, Weiss enrolled at Red Lake Senior High School in Red Lake. Teachers and fellow students remembered him as withdrawn, and he reportedly had a history of troublesome behavior. At times, he was referred to be homeschooled. His grandmother said he had not been in school for five weeks before the shooting. Weiss was teased by fellow students because of his physical appearance. He was six feet tall and 250 pounds. He dressed in all-black clothing with a full-length coat. He usually did not respond to their taunts, but it seems the pressure was slowly building up. Weiss first took the life of his grandfather, a police officer, and his grandfather's partner at home before going to school to commit the carnage. Seven others were wounded. When police cornered Weiss inside the school, he shot himself. Yeah, they got along good. He was a good role model for all the kids on the reservation, not just ours, yeah. We're going to ask why. And to me, that's going to be the hardest. You know, it's just a very tragic thing that happened. And He um, never showed us the violent side of him. That's why it's so hard for us to understand this. Um, Dear there told us that that was a fad. He's seeing a lot of that. Depression. Prozac. And he was taking this all the way mm -hmm. until... Another student believed to be involved in planning the event was arrested one week after the shootings. He was charged with conspiracy to commit slaying based on several email messages he exchanged with Jeff Weiss, which involved plans for the Red Lake High School attack. The conspiracy charge was eventually dropped, though he pled guilty to transmitting threatening messages through the internet. This student was Louis Jourdain, Soin of Floor Joydane Jr., tribal chairman of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Native Americans. Number 8. Michael Carneal Michael Carneal, a name that became synonymous with tragic school attacks, was born on May 10, 1983, in Paducah, Kentucky. His early life appeared ordinary, but hidden beneath the surface were signs of deep-seated turmoil that would eventually lead to a devastating act of violence. Carneal's struggles with mental health began to emerge during his adolescence. He showed signs of depression and isolation, often feeling disconnected from his peers. 
It's been 25 years since the shooting at Heath High School. The victims and their families waiting for it um, was worth it. I mean, it, it was hard and, you know, left us really wondering what knowing this day was going to come. And now that it's here, it's really hard to. Um, friends are not my friends or anybody, you know, I mean, makes me feel terrible that I did that to anybody at all. I'm sorry for what I did. I know it's not going to change anything. It's not going to make anything better. I have to think that after 25 years, he is a different person than he was that day. As he entered Heath High School, his feelings of alienation intensified, and he harbored resentment towards those around him. On December 1, 1997, at the age of 14, Carneal carried out a shocking and unprovoked attack that forever altered the lives of his schoolmates and community. He opened fire on a group of students during a prayer meeting at Heath High School, slaying three students and injuring five others. In the aftermath of the shooting, Carneal was apprehended and charged with slaying and attempted slaying. He pled guilty with reason of insanity to the charges against him. On August 11, 1998, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Carneal became one of the youngest individuals in the U.S. to receive such a sentence. Number 7. Dylan Cossey In 2007, 14-year-old Dylan Cossey from Plymouth Township, Pennsylvania, was arrested for plotting a Columbine-style attack on a local high school. Dylan was enrolled in public school through middle school. He experienced bullying and frequent torment. As a result, his guidance counselor referred him in 2005 to a support team. This team met with his mother, 46-year-old Michelle Cossey, who expressed at the time she was concerned about, among other things, her son's military obsession. In 2006, the district said it was actively and constructively working with the family until the family chose to withdraw the child from the colonial school district. He had heard some uh, suggestion that there had been a, a violent act in, in Finland, um, so he was very uh, active murder. Engaged in a criminal act, so he, he certainly could not have encouraged him. There was nothing conspiratorial between them. I don't believe he's in a position to accept any responsibility. He feels bad, very, very bad about what happened. It was in seventh grade that Michelle withdrew Dylan from public school to be homeschooled. During this time, Michelle directly helped Dylan obtain weapons. This despite her own expressed concern in 2005 that he had a disconcerting military obsession. She illegally bought Dylan a 22 caliber handgun, a 22 caliber rifle, and a 9mm rifle with a laser scope. Inspired by the bullying he experienced in public school, Dylan developed a plan to attack a public high school, Plymouth White Marsh High School. On his MySpace page, Dylan listed the Columbine school slang as an interest and paid tribute to that shooting's masterminds, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. His slaughter plans were prevented when he attempted to recruit another boy. The attempted recruit tipped off the police. When police searched Dylan's room, they found an entire inventory of weaponry, including not only guns, but swords and an explosive-making book. Dylan was charged with conspiracy and solicitation to commit a slaying, as well as conspiracy to commit terrorist acts. He was sentenced in December 2007 to up to seven years in a juvenile treatment center. The students accused reportedly giving the details of their plan to investigators this morning. They are. Uh, however, the ruse was they wanted him wearing white because in one of our subsequent interviews, he divulged that. Uh, Forty saying those students who came forward are heroes by speaking up. Number six, Demetrios Pagurtsis. On May 18, 2018, a mass school slaying occurred at Santa Fe High School in Santa Fe, Texas, in the Houston metropolitan area. Ten people, eight students and two teachers were fatally shot, and 13 others were wounded. Dimitrios Pogortsis, a 17-year-old student at the school, was taken into custody. The shooting is the third deadliest high school mass slaying in the U.S. after the Stoneman Douglas High School slaying in 2018 and the Columbine High School slaying in 1999. The shooter told police he meant to slay the classmates he shot and wanted to spare the students he liked so he could have his story told. And you have been charged with um, aggravated assault against a public servant. I'm denying you that I read your rights this afternoon. You're not entering a plea today. Thanks. And a third time saying that you'll keep your appointments and tell us if you change your address or phone number. All right, you have any questions? On for any other charge. I'm going to ask you to sign the front page, which is just acknowledging. The shooting lasted about 25 minutes until he was arrested. 
Pogortsis is charged with the capital slaying of multiple people, an aggravated attack against a public servant, and is held in custody without bail. If convicted, he faces a maximum sentence of 40 years to life. According to at least one witness, Pogortsis was bullied by multiple students and coaches. The school denied the allegations of bullying by coaches. One of his former teachers described him as quiet, but he wasn't quiet in a creepy way, and said that he had never seen him draw or write anything in his class journal that she found suspicious or unusual. Pogortsis's journals on his computer and cell phone, found by police after the shooting, suggested to Governor Greg Abbott not only did he want to commit the shooting, but he wanted to take his own life after the shooting, planned on doing this for some time. He advertised his intentions, but somehow slipped through the cracks. We've ever seen in the history of Texas schools. Shooting at the high school, have an officer. Uh, were owned or, or legally possessed uh, by the shooter. I have no information at this time whether or not the father was aware that, that his son had taken as far as uh, arrest or confrontation with law enforcement as far as having uh, uh, a criminal history. Number five, Devin Erickson. A school slayer in suburban Denver was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Devin Erickson, 20, was convicted of first degree slaying in the shooting demise of classmate Kendrick Castillo, along with 45 other charges in connection with the 2019 attack at STEM School Highlands Ranch. A jury found Erickson partnered with fellow student Alec McKinney to plan the attack for weeks. McKinney testified he wanted to target students who mocked him because he was transgender. Judge Teresa Michelle Slade added hundreds of years to Erickson's mandatory life sentence after hearing lengthy and emotional testimony from survivors. Erickson was stone-faced as the verdict was read, but his voice broke when the judge asked him if he wanted to speak, right after his family members testified that they loved him. Looking at life without possibility of parole and countless years. Courtroom watched on. I was sitting next to Erickson's parents, and I think I could see tears. We acknowledge the seat of the, of the complaint and waive any further reading and advisement at this time. Those hearings, but we are not requesting that a hearing necessarily be set today. We're requesting that instead the list is unreasonable and grant the status. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. the family of Kendrick Castillo after a long and emotional day in court. His dad John was played. Erickson kept his, kept his head low so he wouldn't be able to see it. McKinney was sentenced to life in prison previously but could be eligible for parole after 20 years since he was a juvenile. The two shooters targeted a dark classroom where students were watching a movie. They entered through separate doors to maximize the carnage and planned to have McKinney perish either by taking his own life or at the hands of his cohort, according to prosecutors. The carnage was thwarted when Castillo and two other students, Joshua Jones and Brendan Bialy, charged Erickson as his gun jammed. McKinney was arrested by a security guard. Erickson's father, Jim Erickson, read aloud the names of the victims and apologized to the community. We pray for these people every day, he said through tears. Number four, Adam Lanza. The Sandy Hook Elementary School attack was one of the deadliest shootings in the history of the U.S., and behind it was 20-year-old Adam Lanza. The attack began when Adam Lanza slayed his mother, Nancy, at the home that the two shared in Newtown. She was shot four times with a 22 caliber rifle. Adam Lanza gathered the AR-15, two pistols and a shotgun, as well as several hundred rounds of ammunition, and drove his mother's car to Sandy Hook Elementary School, a public school in Newtown, for kindergarten through fourth grade. Leaving the shotgun in the car, Lanza shot his way through a window next to the school's locked security door just after 9.30 a.m. He was immediately confronted by Sandy Hook principal Don Hawksprung and school psychologist Mary Sherlock. Lanza shot and took the lives of both women, but the encounter and the sounds of gunfire were broadcast to individual classrooms via the school's public address system. He into your eyes for more than a couple seconds. He'd always look down at his paper or whatever he was doing. Hurt himself. He would not know it or feel it. So we were being very, very careful with him. It was during the second classroom episode that he heard responders coming. And Three students will, in a matter of days, start attending classes at an unused school in a neighboring town. In accordance with previously established lockdown protocols, teachers immediately took steps to attempt to safeguard their students, concealing them in closets or bathrooms and barricading doors with furniture or with their own bodies. Lanza entered the classroom of teacher Lauren Russo and took her life and those of 14 children. 
He then went to a second classroom where first grade teacher Victoria Soto had hidden her students in a closet. She attempted to misdirect Lanza by telling him that her class was in the school's auditorium on the other side of the building. Lanza slayed Soto, as well as six students who attempted to flee from their hiding place. Also slain in the shooting were Anne Marie Murphy, a special education aide, and behavioral therapist Rachel Davino. Two other Sandy Hook staff members were injured. Lanza fired 154 rounds in less than five minutes, claiming 26 lives. The first officers to enter the building caught a glimpse of an individual dressed in dark clothing, and after hearing a series of shots, they found Lanza near the door to Soto's classroom, deceased from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Number 2. Kip Kinkle A day after being expelled from school for bringing a gun to class, 15-year-old Kiplin Kinkle returned to Thurston High School in Springfield, Oregon and opened fire in the cafeteria, slaying two students and wounding 22 others. The attack was brought to a halt by 17-year-old wrestling student Jake Riker, who despite being shot in the chest, tackled Kiplin as he was reloading. Several others quickly piled on to pin the freckle-faced rampager to the ground until police arrived. The heroic Riker was shot in the hand while trying to subdue the assassin and had another gunshot wound to the chest. He survived. When it was all over, 17-year-old Mikhail Nicolason was deceased on the scene, and 16-year-old Ben Walker perished in the hospital early the next day from wounds to the head. The day before the rampage, Kip, who was jokingly voted most likely to start World War III in middle school, had been arrested, expelled from school, and released to his parents' custody on a charge of possessing a stolen firearm. For Mr. Kinkle, in addition to helping our victims feel safe for their lifetimes, um, I feel intense anger, but no hatred towards Kipling Kinkle. I don't know all the pain. I feel that I got off quite light. I don't have the emotional my mind that this sentence did not end this case today, that it has in fact preserved it for at least a couple of Mr. Kinkle, but also for this community and those victims. We needed closure and I don't think this case, I don't think this sentence is. Following the rampage, investigators found the parents deceased in separate rooms of their suburban home. The parents, William P. Kinkle, 59, and Faith M. Kinkle, 57, were both teachers. The father was retired from teaching Spanish at Thurston High. The mother taught Spanish at a nearby high school. Investigators think Kip might have slain them separately the day before the rampage. Explosive squad officials were called in after police searched the Kinkle home, found five sophisticated explosives, 15 other inactive explosive devices, detailed explosive making instructions, and various chemicals that could be used to make explosives. When the demolition experts were removing some of the explosives, one of the handmade devices was accidentally detonated. A fifth explosive was found by investigators when they tried to remove his mother's body. Authorities also found two howitzer shell casings and a hand grenade. In retrospect, Kip was nothing other than a budding psychopath. He always said that it would be fun to slay someone and do stuff like that, said a student. Yesterday, he told a couple of people he was probably going to do something stupid today and get back at the people who had expelled him. Kinkle allegedly gave a talk in speech class about how to build an explosive and bragged about torturing animals. According to Nissa Lund, 14, Kip told her he once stuffed lit firecrackers in a cat's mouth. Rachel Dawson, Kip's former girlfriend in middle school, said he boasted about shooting little cats. Clearly a serial slayer in the making, Kip also talked about blowing up a cow. In November 1999, he was sentenced to more than 111 years in prison without a chance of parole. Camera moving, I just kind of swivel with us. Why don't you walk me through this line of Number 2. Barry Lucatus Barry Lucatus is a convicted slayer who took the lives of three people in a school mass slaying at Frontier Junior High in Moses Lake, Washington on February 2, 1996. Lucatus was born to Terry Lucatus and Joanne Phillips. He spent the early part of his life in Iowa and Minnesota and moved to Washington in fifth grade. His parents owned and operated a sandwich and ice cream shop in Moses Lake. Years before the shooting, his father began an affair and his mother became increasingly distant and often spoke of taking her own life. 
She frequently implied that Barry would also have to slay himself. Shooting at Frontier Middle School was not about Barry Lukaitis being bullied. The classmates that he killed back then, he was experiencing some of the same frustrations that a lot of adolescents feel. And 21... To good people, and that they can, that you can never, you can never... Stop shooting. Barry, without hesitation, shot have to come back to this courthouse and look at him and worry about the sentence and so this afternoon he actually signed up in january of 1996 she informed barry the date of the double slaying would be valentine's day however it is widely believed and he himself claimed that relentless bullying at the school impelled him to this bloody rampage on the 2nd of february 1996 barry lucatus 14 dressed as a wild west style gunslinger and used a duster coat to conceal a hunting rifle and two handguns. He was carrying almost 80 rounds of ammunition. Rather than taking the bus, he walked the distance between his house and the middle school. Lucatus opened fire on his algebra teacher as soon as she opened the door and hit her with one round in the chest. She perished immediately, still holding an eraser in her hand. He then fired at students, slaying two, one of them a bully to him. He also shot a girl in the arm. Lucatus took hostages for a short amount of time, but released the wounded. The hostage situation was stopped when teacher John Lane came into the room, assisted in the evacuation of injured students, then tackled Lucatus, keeping him there until police arrived. On September 24, 1997, Lucatus was convicted of two counts of first-degree slaying, one count of second-degree slaying, one count of first-degree attempted slaying, and 16 counts of aggravated kidnapping. He was sentenced to serve two life sentences and an additional 205 years without the possibility of parole. He is currently imprisoned at the Clallam Bay Correction Center in Washington State. The Washington State Court of Appeals denied Lucatus's request for a new trial in 1999. Like you said, nothing more sensitive than this. They went through a trial. Now it's back. I mean, the trial concluded about another trial. This is strictly a sentencing issue and getting Mr. Lucatus back before the sentencing court. Back. I mean, the trial concluded in September of 1997, and here we are in 2015, and now we're... Number one, Evan Ramsey. Evan Ramsey is a convicted serial slayer who took the lives of two and wounded two in a mass school slaying at Bethel Regional High School in Bethel, Alaska on February 19, 1997. Ramsey was a 16-year-old sophomore at the time. When Evan Ramsey was five years old, his father was imprisoned after a police standoff and his mother became an alcoholic. Evan and his family shortly after were forced to relocate around the Anchorage area after their house was set on fire. When Evan was seven, the Anchorage Department of Youth and Family Services removed Evan and his two brothers from his mother's custody and placed them in foster care. But the two friends who he says egged him on were also charged with murder. While both denied the, the custody of his parents, the other was convicted of second-degree murder and is currently serving time in a juvenile center. Before he committed the crime, I had a girlfriend at the time. She said, goodbye, no more you. Hey, just ignore it. So you can only ignore something for so long. How did the idea to go into school with a gun begin? It began by, and so I guess they said, well, okay, well, if you're gonna do this, then why don't you? Evan was soon separated from his older brother, John, and lived in 11 foster homes between 1988 and 1991. Ramsey and his younger brother were allegedly maltreated by several foster parents. Evan's younger brother, William, claimed that their foster brothers would pay other children to beat Evan as a sick game. Evan was adopted with his brother at age 10 and settled in Bethel, Alaska with their foster mother. Evan Ramsey has suffered from depression since early childhood and had attempted to take his own life when he was 10 years old. On the 19th of February, Ramsey entered the school lobby brandishing a shotgun and slew 15-year-old student Josh Palacios. He then shot the principal and wounded two more shortly after. He then put the shotgun barrel under his chin, but couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. When police arrived on the scene, he surrendered. She spoke some more. She actually asked me to give her the shotgun. And James and Matthew and one of my friends, I didn't know what to do with the shotgun. The police rushed me and I was taken into custody. Ramsey was reportedly picked on frequently at school. According to friends, Ramsey wasn't very smart and was often called names such as retard, spaz, or brain dead. 
Additionally, Evan wasn't the first in his family to bring a gun into a public place. In 1986, Evan's father Don was nicknamed Rambo of Alaska after an incident in which a newspaper refused to publish his letter. He went to the newspaper's office armed with a rifle and a 44 Magnum revolver and over 200 rounds of ammunition. After a short standoff, Don Ramsey surrendered and was imprisoned. Two weeks after his father was paroled, Evan perpetrated the school mass slaying. Reports say over 20 people knew of Ramsey's plan to shoot up the school and two actually helped Ramsey, one by teaching him how to use a shotgun and the other telling him of the infamy that would come. I got tired of being picked on and I decided that, man, I gotta, yes, some people hid behind stuff. Uh, I found out after reading I pointed the gun, I pointed and shot at him, and I went, uh, went off on its own when I was at the stairwell, and it fired into a locker. Reports say one student even brought a camera to school on the day. Ramsey also played Doom frequently, and his father told the press after the shooting that he believed his son may have been imitating Doom, a first-person shooter video game. Ramsey was charged as an adult and sentenced to 200 years in a maximum security prison and is eligible for parole in 2066. Thanks for watching our video, folks. That's all for today, and we'll see you in our next video.